Good morning, Robert Rose Baptist Church. Good morning, Pastor What do you see when you look out the window? Sunshine. Beautiful sunshine. Have we not been blessed with a great day to be in the house of worship today? Yes. Do you ever stop and think about the little things? The little things that are really important in life, and we too often fail to recognize that those little things are blessings also. Yes. You know, a great sunny day. The grace of another day, Robert, is, is that not special? Amen. And the grass growing, the flowers out there, just the blooming, and the robin singing, and in our case, the woodpecker pecker on the tree right outside. But it's all good. They're, they're little blessings. They're just so, so special. And special to be here in Robert Road again. That's right. Music, songs, boy, you always pick out some of our favorites. In fact, that last one, our voice to the blood, one of my very favorites because my family gospel band from the time I was going to sing that over and over and over again. But you know, I really love that other one that we say, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Amen. Oh, and you can take that to the bank. <laughs> Nothing more special. Glad to be here today. We want to have some church. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Pardon me. Let me first put in a quick commercial break. Uh, May 14th, next Saturday, at uh, Mountain View Baptist Church is an all-day gospel sing. It starts at about 10, so I guess it won't be quite all day. Uh, probably end about 4 or 5 o'clock. Five different bands will be appearing in the gospel music throughout the day. So if you got nothing better to do, or even if you got something better to do, try to make it uh, older. There's going to be some great groups. Uh, maybe uh, you've heard of... Uh, Fresh Harbor Revival. They're just, just a great gospel for grass group. Terry Hudson, Pastor Terry, from coming up from Phoenix. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, Sidekicks will be there. Uh, a couple oh, other groups. So, having said that, we recognize that today is a special day. We're celebrating mothers. And did you ever stop to think about where you'd be without them? Hmm. Oh, really? I was down in the valley recently visiting a friend of mine, Jay. And as old timers do, we were sitting to talk about one of our favorite subjects. Where's a good place to go eat? Uh, Jay, my wife, and Jay's wife had adjourned to the kitchen. And as we were talking, Jay said, you know, Ronnie says, just last week we found a new restaurant over here. He says, it's a great place, a big, varied menu. We give you a nice portion and the prices were right. He said, it's, it's a place that I can really recommend. I said, well, I won't make it today, but I'll look it up the next time I'm in the valley. What's the name of it? He looked at me with the most quizzical expression I've ever seen on anybody. And he sat there for a minute. And then he said, Ron, he said, what's the name of that flower? You know, it's got some little prickly thorns on the side. And, most people buy it for special occasions, you know, it smells real nice and all. I said, well, Jay, that's a rose. He said, you're right. And then he hollered into the kitchen. Hey, Rose, what's the name of that restaurant we were at last week? Little humor. Oh, yeah. You know, I brag about you all, all you all. And so uh, Jane insisted. I didn't project on the way out. We brought some roses for each one of you ladies. Each. Take the rose, it kind of depicts both your inner and your outer beauty. So uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Your mother's once again we're here to honor you. With respect to praise reports, we got to visit this week a little bit with the son from Oregon uh, before he leaves for Alaska. He was throughout the summer at uh, fishing camps up in Alaska. So we got to visit with him. Uh, that alone is a great praise report. Other than being here, another great praise report. Uh, Robert may want to say something, but there's a praise report in itself. You know, right. you remember, God bless Robert. Yeah, thank you. I got two praise reports. One is um, 
it's not good the way it came about. The Supreme Court had a leak in, but that's a start to put a direction to overturn Roe v. Wade. So it's kind of the Supreme Court, from what it appears, is going to turn it back down to the state to make a decision because since 1973 we have murdered over 70 million babies. That's a start. And my second first report is um, I met a pastor who was one of the contractors uh, that work in my home. Well, last month, him and uh, over 100 pastors and their wives, they met in Phoenix at the Capitol, and the governor was there, and they prayed over the assembly of the Capitol at Phoenix. So that's a lot of praise report. It's a good direction. Yeah. Hallelujah. So that's it. Anybody else have anything good to report, or was it all bad? <laughs> <laughs> It couldn't have been all bad. We're here to, today together to uh, worship the Lord. Amen. Shall we pray? Father God, we, we just thank you for the grace of today. Everybody present, we ask for blessings on everybody that's here. And I'll offer up a special thanks just for the opportunity to be here to share with our dear brothers and sisters. Spread the gospel and enjoy the Lord. We do thank you for that gift of salvation. You know, the fact that you gave your only son for all our sins, and we know that any and all can be forgiven just by accepting Christ as Savior. And finally, we ask a special blessing on the mothers, all mothers everywhere. Let us learn from the message today as we thank you for all your many blessings. Amen. Amen. So I know that many mothers pray. Many mothers pray out of necessity. And I think a lot of mothers pray because motherhood is not easy. In fact, it's extremely difficult. Someone said this, Mother's Day is traditionally the day when children give something back to their mothers for all the spit they produce, to wash the dirty faces, all the old gum on their hands, all the noses they wiped, and all the bloody knees they made well with their kisses. And that in no way begins, I think, to scratch the surface for all the many incidences that mothers everywhere are faced with. This is the day where mothers are rewarded. Well, maybe that's not the best choice of words. Uh, could be repaid, acknowledged. You can choose whatever word works for you. But they're acknowledged for washing sheets in the middle of the night, driving kids to school when they miss the bus. And during all of those football and soccer games, a lot of them like the rain. Did they miss anything? Of course, that list is never ending. It's a day of appreciation for making your children finish something that they said that they couldn't do. We're not believing them when they said, I hate you sharing all their good times and their bad. So what are mothers? Well, to begin with, mothers are teachers. They're disciplinarians. Mothers are cleaning ladies. Sometimes they're out there lawn mowers, mowing the lawn, <coughs> gardening. Mothers are nurses. They're psychologists, they're doctors, they're counselors, they're chauffeurs, coaches. What did I leave out? I need a little help here. Anybody? Mothers are love. All right, more help. What did I leave out? What are mothers? Seamstresses. Perfect. We know mothers are also developers of personalities. They're molders of vocabularies, shapers of attitudes. And mothers are soft voices saying, I love you. Mothers are a link to God, probably the very first link, a child's first impression of God's love. Amen. Mothers are all these things and much, much more. And I think you can take that to the bank. I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians right now, 13, 4 through 7. My version says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. 
It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And that, brothers and sisters, is truth for all time. Good place for an amen. 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 You know, one of my favorite columns, written by Irma Bombeck, told of God out there in the act of creating mothers. And she said that on the day that God created mothers, he was into overtime already. He had been working hard all day to create a mother. And here it was late in the day. He spent uh, many, many hours on this. And an angel appeared and said, Lord, he said, you're sure spending a lot of time on this one. And the Lord turned and said to the angel, he said, have you read the specs on this model? He says she's supposed to be completely washable, but not plastic. She's to have 180 moving parts, all of them replaceable. She has to have a kiss that will heal everything from a broken leg to a broken heart. She's to have a laugh that will disappear when she stands up, and she must be able to function on black coffee and leftovers. Yeah. And she's supposed to have six pairs of hands. Six pairs of hands, said the angel? That's impossible. Well, the Lord said, it's not the six pairs of hands that's the problem for me. He says, it's these three pairs of eyes. She's supposed to have one pair that sees through the closed doors. When she yells in there to the guest, what are you doing in there? She already knows. Yeah. She's going to have a pair in the back of her head to see what she's not supposed to see, but she must. And then that pair right there in front, where she can look at the child who goofed. The child made a mistake. And she can communicate her love and her understanding with just her eyes. Without saying anything. Well, that's too much, said the angel. You can't put that much in one model. Why don't you rest a while and just resume this tomorrow? No, I can't, said the Lord. I'm close to creating someone very much like myself. I've already come up with a model who can heal herself when she is sick. Who can feed a family of six with just one pound of hamburger. It didn't mention maybe a little hamburger helped along the way too. Uh, yeah. And she could persuade a nine-year-old to take a shower. All that alone right there is just enough to drive anyone to a frazzle. I'm going to pause for a moment now. I'm going to read you from 1 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. Here's what he has to say. I think it's very special. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourself instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is so precious to God. Wow, are those some important words? Brothers and sisters, I think she hit the nail or he hit the nail on the head right there. True beauty comes from within. Amen. And also from the acceptance of the responsibilities that motherhood has. So let's continue on. So then the angel looked over at the model. Motherhood looked closely. He said, she's too soft. Oh, but she's tough, said the Lord. You'd be so surprised at how much this mother can do. Can she think, asked the angel. Not only can she thanks of the Lord, but she can reason and she can compromise and she can persuade. Then the angel reached over and touched her cheek. This one has a leak, he said. I told you you couldn't put that much in just one model. That's not a leak, said the Lord, that's a tear. What's a 
cheer for as the angel. Well, it's for joy, it's for kindness, it's for sorrow, it's for disappointment, it's for pride. You're a genius, said the angel, and the Lord said, oh, but I didn't know. I think it's pretty profound. You know, maybe with all this in mind now that what we talk about, we can better understand a lady named Mrs. Zebedee, who was the mother of the apostles, James and John. And you want to follow along with me now? I'm going to be reading from Matthew 20, verses 20 through 23. Then the mother of Zebedee, the mother of Zebedee's sons, came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. So you see here, Mrs. Zebedee, was, she was very much aware of the teachings of Christ and the fact that he was born to the other kingdom. And she was also aware that her sons, James and John, were very, very close to him. In fact, they were two-thirds of the inner circle of Peter, James, and John. And she was certain that when the Lord formed his kingdom, that they would have positions of responsibility and authority within his kingdom. But in this very first chapter, Jesus told a story that might have disturbed her a little bit. It was about a landowner who went out and he hired some people to go to work for him in the morning. And they agreed on what they thought would be a fair day's wage. So he hired them and they went back and they began to work. And then at noon he went out and he hired some additional workers. And he brought them aboard and they began to work. And even later in the day, towards the evening, he went out and hired even more workers and brought them in and they began to work. And when they paid them off at the end of the day, they all received the same wage. Hmm. Well, I guess it would be too difficult to maybe devote a whole sermon to that. But this experience just teaches us this is one of the parables of Jesus Christ. And you know what a parable is. It's, it's a story that's used to try to uh, teach a lesson. In Matthew 20, Christ spoke about this parable of workers toiling on land of Israel. Now we're hired to work for God. And when we grasp this truth, I tell you folks, it gives our lives, and even the work we do in our lives, purpose and meaning, fulfillment. And as the story unfolds, we find that all these laborers, no matter how long they worked, received the same wage at the end of the day, one day's wage at Daenerys. But if you think about it, this, this example kind of, uh, kind of defies modern day labor practices, if you think about it. But remember, it is just a parable. We, we note that many of those that worked the whole day and drew their pay at the end of the day complained about this practice. But I want us to look at the point that it makes. After hearing the complaint, the landowner said to them, they been there all day working, he said, I am doing you no wrong. Did we not agree for the denarius for one day's work? Take what is yours and go your way. Each worker had agreed for what he would work for for a few days later. One denarius. Those at the beginning of the day had accepted that offer. They thought it was fair. They thought it was appropriate. No one had any reason at all to complain 
about what others can do. What happened outside the realm of their agreement should have no barrier. You see, God holds all wealth, but He's generous and gracious to all of us. And the obvious, obvious message to me from this parable is this. Think about this now. Those called and chosen at the last have access to God's kingdom just as those called and chosen at the start of the day. Amen. No difference. God's grace to those who are faithful is a key lesson. You might have been faithful all your life. You might have been faithful when we started this morning. Equal for all. That's a pretty darn important lesson. Well, I kind of digressed a little bit, so let's get back to Mrs. Ebony. She began to wonder, will my sons really have positions of authority in this new kingdom? So when the opportunity presented herself, she went to Jesus. And Matthew says that she bowed down before him. And she made this request. She said, when you establish your kingdom, please let my son sit at your left and right sides in positions of honor and authority. Well, I guess we might criticize Mrs. Zebedee if we choose to for being so old. But since this is Mother's Day, maybe we ought to thank, thank her and think for a minute about some of the positive things from this particular exercise. We need to recognize that when she came to Jesus, while Jesus did not grant her request, he did not deny it either. He simply reminded her of the cost to be seated on the right or left. And that it was the Father who would make the decision, who would determine who will be there. A couple points I think Mrs. Ebony makes here. Number one, she wanted her sons to be a part of his kingdom. That's certainly probably the most important. She came to the Lord asking that her sons might be a part of his kingdom. And I can think of no more important task of motherhood than that. To seek to assure that your children are part of the kingdom of God. As I said earlier, I know many mothers pray. Sometimes they pray out of necessity and at other times they pray because motherhood is not easy. We know that. Extremely difficult. James Dobson, a writer, tells about the time he came home when his son Ryan was just a small baby. It had been a terrible day for his wife Shirley. Ryan had been sick and cried all day. And once as she was changing the diapers, the telephone rang and Shirley reached out to grab the phone. She didn't get the diaper all fastened up and just then Ryan had another attack of diarrhea. Woo! Well, she cleaned up that mess. She put him in some clean, sweet-smelling clothing. She took him into the living room and fed him. And as she was burping him, you probably guessed it, he threw up all over himself and her and the couch. Mm. And Dobson wrote this, he said, when I came home, I could smell the aroma of motherhood everywhere. <laughs> Shirley says, was all this in my contract? <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes mothers do pray just as out of frustration. A lot of times it's the frustration of trying to teach the children and how difficult it is when we realize the difficulties of communication back and forth. Another short story, a preacher friend of mine remembered very clearly. He said he gave his son, Steve, his very first responsibility. He told Steve to watch Susan, the baby's sister, while he stepped out of the room for a moment. And he had only been gone in a few minutes when he heard a thump. And then that baby started crying, just awaiting. And he rushed back into the room. Susan fallen off the couch and stretched out on the floor. And meanwhile, Steve sat there just looking innocent. My friend said, Steve, I told you to watch her. Steve answered, I did. I watched her fall and I watched her cry. He <laughs> did exactly as he was told to do. So, the point is, being a parent is not easy. Sometimes you're filled with joy, 
Sometimes you're filled with frustration, disappointment, or sadness. Sometimes your children make you so proud that you just want to pop your buttons. Ever been there? Mm -hmm. Another time you can't even find enough handkerchiefs to dry your tears. So I can understand the feelings of a mother with three children who's asked, if you had it to do all over again, would you still want children? Yes, she replied, just not the same ones. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it is not easy. It is difficult. But Mrs. Ebony teaches a very important lesson here, a very valuable example. For she asked earnestly for her sons to be a part of the kingdom. And we got to have that same concern for our children. What good is it if our children go out and they're a tremendous success in the world? Good jobs. Money like you wouldn't believe. Probably they make as much maybe the years I made all my life. They're a success and they're driving the big fine cars. Living in the big fine houses in all the greatest of neighborhoods but they don't know God. What does it matter if they gain the whole world only to lose their soul? So I hope that in the heart of every mother and father here today, that there's a burden to go to the throne of God and pray for your children. Pray that they'll be saved, saved from that eternal damnation for eternal life. That's the place to be. A lot of you know I have four children. They're not all saved. But it's my duty, my obligation as a parent to pray as I do every day. Each and every one of them comes to And then secondly, I think Mrs. Ebony said she wanted her sons to be actively involved in the work of the kingdom. Not just to be a part, actively involved. Maybe it's not enough just to be saved. You know, churches today are just full of people, content just to fill up a pew on Sunday morning. That's as far as it goes. There's a lot of people just willing to sit back and receive the blessings and seldom when they get involved in doing the end of the work in the church. So where does the spirit of service begin? It begins at home. The parents setting the examples. But the parents prayed that their sons and daughters might be involved in the work of the kingdom as teachers and leaders and discipling others that they may go out and find the lost and see that the church continues on and on until Jesus comes again. Amen. Amen. Mrs. Ebony asked that her children would be actively involved in the work of his kingdom. We need to walk in this Proverbs 33, just for a moment. I'll read this. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Motherhood. Oh, how sweet. And finally, the third point I got here from Mrs. Ebony is that she had big expectations. When you're working in a kingdom, there are no higher positions of authority than to sit on the right and the left of the king himself. And that's what she wanted for her sons. She didn't ask for her children just to be doorkeepers. She wanted them there on the right and the left hand side of Jesus. And we might think that Mrs. Ebony is a little bit brash, presumptuous, but I admire her boldness. Too, too often people have settled for mediocrity in the church. Too long they've just been content with it. Sitting back, making it through the door. Lord, look at me. I'm in the church. Sit back and let things happen. It's time to take a position to others and sisters right and left side to become leaders. 
holy fashioning the outreach of the church and mobilizing to make sure that the message of Christ is out to all the world. It's the time for us to strive for excellence. To reach for the very best there is. The Lord calls us to be his disciples and to be effective laborers in his kingdom. Those of you who were here last Sunday, you know I talked about that just a little bit. We talked about disciples. My definition stands still today. A fully devoted follower of Jesus. That's a disciple of God. Do you remember Irma Bombeck? She had God saying as he was creating a mother, I am close to creating something very much like myself. That is so precious. I suppose maybe that's why today it's so special. Because we can recognize that mother's love is probably the closest example we have to God's love. Amen. It's love that goes through the valley of the shadow of death to bring life into being. It's love that sacrifices itself over and over and over again. And it's a love that dare to death, lay down its own life for its own strength. That's some kind of love. This story is told out of World War II. In the Holocaust. The Holocaust took the lives of millions. It's the story of Solomon Rosenberg and his family, and this is a true story. Solomon Rosenberg and his wife and their two sons and his mother and father were arrested and placed in a Nazi concentration camp. Folks, it was a labor game, and the rules were real simple. As long as you can do your work, you're permitted to live. When you become too weak to do your work, then you will be exterminated. And Rosenberg watched his mother and his father marched off to their deaths. And he thought for sure that the next one would be his young son, David. David had always been a frail child. And every evening, Rosenberg would get back into the camp, and he'd run into the barracks. For hours, he'd look for his family, search for the faces. When he found them, they'd all huddle together, embrace one another, and thank God for another day of life. And then one day, Rosenberg came back, and he didn't see all those familiar faces. He did, though, finally found his oldest son, Joshua in the court, huddled, weeping, and praying. And he said, Josh, tell me it's not true. And Josh turned and said, it is true, Father. Today, David was not strong enough to do his work. So they came for him. But well, where is your mother? Asked Mr. Rosenberg. Oh, Papa, he said. When he came for David, he was afraid and he cried. Mama said, there's nothing to be afraid of, David. And she took his hand and went with him. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Let me share just a little bit more scripture here. I've got a few more minutes, I think. Before I conclude today's message, I'm going to go over to Proverbs 6, 20-22. That particular passage says, My child, obey your father's godly instruction and follow your mother's life-giving teaching. Fill your heart with their advice and let your life be shaped by what they taught you. Their wisdom will guide you wherever you go and keep you from bringing harm to yourself. Their instruction will whisper to you at every sunrise and direct you through a brand new day. I'm so glad I came across those words for today. And then finally, from Proverbs again, 23, verses 22 through 25. Those verses say, Give respect to your father and mother, for without them you wouldn't be here. And don't neglect them when they grow old. Embrace the truth and hold it close. 
Don't let go of wisdom, instruction, and life-giving understanding. When the father observes his child living in godliness, he is ecstatic with joy, and nothing makes him proud. So may your father's heart burst with joy, and may your mother's soul be filled with gladness because of you. Pretty good summation of motherhood. Mothers, this is your day, and God bless you in it. Well, I pray anybody here today that hasn't experienced the love of God that is so close to the love of a mother. Now might be the time for that decision. I pray that if you felt that you ever had to walk through the valley alone, that you'll recognize that there's a hand reaching out. Say, there's nothing to be afraid of. I'll go with you. I pray that you'll recognize that there's one who's already gone through the valley. Made it possible for you. And now I will close with this short story. It's called Somebody Said. Somebody said it takes about six weeks to get back to normal after you've had a baby. Somebody doesn't know that once you're a mother, normal is history. <laughs> Somebody said you learn how to be a mother by instinct. Somebody never took a three-year-old shot. <laughs> Somebody said being a mother is boring. Somebody never rode in a car driven by a teenager with a driver's permit. <laughs> Somebody said if you're a good mother, your child will turn out good. Somebody thinks the child comes with directions and a guarantee. Somebody said good mothers never raised their voices. Somebody never came out the back door just in time to see her child hit a golf ball through the neighbor's kitchen window. <laughs> mother, don't be loved. Somebody said you don't need an education to be a mother. Somebody never helped a fourth grader with his or her man. <laughs> Somebody said you can't love the fifth child as much as you love the first. Somebody doesn't have five children. <laughs> Somebody said a mother can find all the answers to her child-hearing questions, her child-hearing questions in books. Somebody never had a child stuff beans up his nose or his ears. <laughs> the true lessons, are they not? Somebody said the hardest part of being a mother is labor and delivery. Somebody never watched her baby get on the bus for the first day of kindergarten or on a plane headed for the military. Somebody said a mother can do her job with her eyes closed and one hand tied behind her back. <laughs> Somebody never organized seven gigging brownies to sell cookies. Somebody said a mother can stop worrying after her child gets married. <laughs> yeah, somebody doesn't know that marriage has a new son or daughter-in-law to a mother's heart. Somebody said a mother's job is done when her last child leaves home. Somebody never had grandchildren. And finally, somebody said your mother knows you love her, so you don't need to tell her. Somebody isn't the mother. Cherish your mother. It's all that's something to think about. Church, he extends his invitation in much the same way that a mother opens the door and calls her children in. Come on home. It's called for you today. I would pray that if you need to, you come forward as we extend the invitation. I hope I've given you something to think about today. You can choose what your take home will be. I think Mother's Day is every day. It's nice to single out one special day. Let's don't forget our mothers every other day of the year. They're so sweet, so precious. Even those that don't have their mothers with them here on this earth. A lot of us still talk to them every day. Thank you for the good lessons they taught us. Either your relationship, your friendship with God, or out there for the asking. Again, one of my prayers is if you don't have that relationship, I pray that you find it. 
It's also remembered just how special Mother's Day is. We acknowledge and appreciate it. So if it's time for you to consider a change in your life, we welcome you up to the altar. Don't forget to get a rose on your way out. 